C-SPAN's Washington Journal continues. And we're back to the newspapers on this 4th of July. We begin our discussion this morning with Congressman Tom Davis of Virginia, who's been here early reading the papers. Right. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Happy holiday to you. Thank you. What's the first story you want to talk about? Well, I think the biggest story of the day is Yeltsin's reelected as president. That seems to be the headline in all of the uh, papers from New York Times, Baltimore Sun, Washington Times, Washington Post, uh, straight on. And that's a, I think that's, a, that's good for us, that Yeltsin, we're dealing now with a known commodity. Uh, return to communism there, I think, raised all kinds of issues uh, for this country in terms of what we do vis-a-vis uh, -vis that section of the world, NATO, and everything else. So we have a little bit of continuity there, and it was a fairly decisive win. So you think the question's settled? For the, for the time being, it is. Now, Yeltsin's health and you know, those issues aren't settled, but I think the election is settled at this point, it appears to be. Moscow's calm today. It was a, it was a decisive win. Christopher Hitchens, you watch foreign policy issues. What do you think about the election results there? Well, if there was such a thing as the international establishment, which I sometimes think there must be, uh, which has a sort of collective mind, then it must be very happy today because it had staked pretty much everything on this victory. Uh, everyone from Helmut Kohl to Strobe Talbot you know, had really invested everything in Yeltsin. They covered up for him on Chechnya. They'd made him huge unsecured loans. They'd lied about the state of his health and uh, all the rest of it. They must be fantastically relieved, but I don't feel very much more secure or, or um, reassured myself. Obviously, the defeat of the Stalinists is a good thing, and I think this is also the la their last chance. If they couldn't come back this time, they'll never be able to do it again. But uh, we have a, a drunken, lying m murderer, actually. I mean, he has committed mass murder in Chechnya and been covered up for um, in the Kremlin. And there's someone whose attitudes are not democratic, um, whose past is not democratic, whose mentality is not democratic. Um, and we've painted ourselves into the same corner as him. What I was touched to see, and by the way, happy Independence Day and congratulations and well done. We, we still have to get rid of the descendants of George III in my home country, but we're working on it, believe me. Um, I was very interested to see that in, in Russia they have a uh, ballot line that says none of the above. You can, you can fill that in. And if uh, enough people had done it, they'd have had to cancel and, and anyone could have run for president. Anyway, I was pleased to see 5%. Of the, of the Russians did take that option, and I wish it was a ballot line available in all democratic countries. It, among all the stories uh, we had to choose from on this 4th fourth, uh, fourth of July, would you have put that first on the list in importance? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it, it's not just important in itself for Russia, which is important in itself, but it's, it's a domestic story. I mean, the United States political establishment had made a huge investment in this election, and it, if it had gone the other way, it would have had amaz amazing uh, domestic repercussions. So, yeah, it, I mean, it deserves its place. Two special guests at the table on this holiday who have been in here in shirt sleeves today honoring the holiday and the relaxed mood at the table this morning. Uh, they've been reading the morning newspapers as we always do here on C-SPAN. And as you know, this is a roundtable discussion that involves you. We'll put the phone lines on the table, uh, rather, the phone lines on the screen, and uh, get a few more items on the table before we take your calls. This morning, we're, we are uh, splitting the lines a little bit differently, and uh, that is to give uh, people who support Senator Dole and those who support President Clinton an opportunity to sound off so we can have uh, time for both sides of the table this morning. And so we've split them differently and we ask your help in uh, staying with that as you phone in today and it gives us a chance to get some mix of opinions here. Congressman Davis, back to you for another article. Okay, well I think the second area that I would look at is on the whole file gate issues with um, Whitewater and everything else. The um, Baltimore Sun has Washington struggles make few waves in Pennsylvania. Actually, that story is Jack German filing from Wilkes-Barre, right. Pennsylvania, saying that he can't find people that are paying attention to what's happening. Well, they have a great quote here. I just hustle windows. I don't worry about politics or that foolishness in Washington. It's always been my view that most people don't think about politics uh, except for a short time. That's why the 30-second spot was born because people can't get up from the couch, they can't get a, go, go get something out of the refrigerator, and they, they just kind of absorb it through osmosis. And that's why the uh, political advertising goes for those short spots, because there is a segment in the electorate that frankly doesn't see politics affecting their everyday life, and that is how uh, political leaders get their message uh, across. Amazing to have that quote on the front page, though. That really doesn't belong on the front page. I mean, for Jack Jamon to go out and find someone who isn't interested is not news. In fact, I would say that for Jack Dumont to go out and find someone who isn't interested in politics is the absolute definition of a non-story. But there's a, there's a series of stories. Here's one. File aid did campaign pranks in 92. Let me just, without pulling them all up, 
Um, the post today on A4 says witnesses described 1990 Clinton meeting um, as, and they were talking about the money that was changing hands for highway appointments. That's the Whitewater trial. Washington Times has file probe to include questionnaire charges about questionnaires, IRS file on one of the ushers at the White House who was fired. Um, the front page, uh, well, the Philadelphia Inquirer has uh, uproar over FBI files, highlights uh, uh, Clinton White House early chaos. Um, the Washington Times has uh, the, uh, the Ken Starrs hatched a probe of Marcisa. New York Post says Livingston took a 40% pay hike while others uh, took pay cuts. Uh, and uh, they had quote the Hill usher, uh, the, ca the uh, White House usher saying the Hill fired me after getting tax records. And uh, so it's New York Times, I think, the only paper that doesn't mention it, which I think has probably been the paper that probably the most pro-Clinton of, uh, so of, of, of any paper. This is an issue that won't go away. It's an issue that I think they're going to have to, is not going off the front page. An issue, what issue specifically? The whole Watergate, uh, uh, white, uh, the, um, excuse me, Whitewater uh, and the file gate issues, uh, FBI uh, files, document, travel gate, it kind of all is, fits together in a maze. And as you read these papers, there are a series of stories in every major paper in the country. Christopher Hitchens, would you like to comment on that or bring a new, to a new topic to the table? Well, I'd say I, that I disagree with, with, with um, Jack Chamond, um, and it's a, it's a common mantra among liberal writers in Washington that this story has no legs, pe people don't care, and so on, as if that was the test. I think, actually, it's become increasingly well understood that, um, and at, so to speak, taxi driver or you know, saloon bar level, at both of which I like to think I spend a lot of time, uh, testing the temperature of the nation. Um, Washington ta taxis mostly? Washington taxis, no, New York taxis, um, um, taxis, street corners, bars, anyway, um, rubbing shoulders in general. The people do sort of roughly know now that the Clintons ran a sort of banana republic operation in Arkansas. They were willing to forgive that at the time and did, um, but th they're a bit worried that some of those practices appear to have been brought to Washington, and yes, I think it will tell, and probably is already telling, um, in the only very crude and I think overrated measurement we have, which is the opinion polls. Um, yeah, I do have another nomination. Um, I noticed when you were talking to Mr. Perez just before we came on that um, you probably hadn't got to page A30 of the post in the final edition, but uh, General Chevron now does have a cabinet post. And it, is. and it is which? And it's been specially created for him. It's Ministry of, I Ministry of Infrastructure. I listened to him last night on Larry King Live. Mr. Netanyahu had not yet decided at 9 o'clock last night. Well, his, his coalition partner, uh, David Levy, threatened to resign if a special post was not right. created for Sharon. It's been, and it's been drawn from many other ministries, including energy, roads, and so on. It's a powerful ministry. It's a super ministry. Now, um, the reason I no notice it is that we also have today um, the War Crimes Tribunal hearings in, um, in The Hague. and. They've placed General Ratko Mladic, um, the chief of staff of the illegal Serbian state, uh, physically at the site of the massacre in Srebrenica. And uh, sorry, am I? No, OK. Please continue. Okay. I'm just getting ready to take a call, and oh, I wasn't right. sure which um, of the lines it was on. Sorry, it looked as if there'd been a meltdown or something. Um, or I thought perhaps I was boring you. Anyway, um, uh, where was I? They've placed General Mladic physically at the site of the mass murderer murder of civilians in Srebrenica. Now, uh, a few years ago, an Israeli um, commission, the, the Kahana Commission, um, found General Sharon complicit, at any rate, in a, in a not dissimilar massacre. And that stain, it seems to me, should disqualify him from having a super ministry created for him. And I think the United States government, which basically is the, is the paymaster of the Israeli government, should make its views known about this appointment. I think it's an incredibly bad start for the Netanyahu regime. Let me go back to domestic politics. Both of you have been critical of the Clinton administration for the, the various stories from Whitewater to Filegate. All this week we've been watching the tobacco story from right. the campaign I had trail. that on, by the way, for my third story. What's your assessment of what it all means? I think it's a counterattack right now, uh, coming coming back uh, at, at uh, Senator Dole. I think Senator Dole made a... by whom? Uh, well, by the basically, I think it's moved from the White House. I think the media has picked up on it because it's an interesting story. Um, I think also that uh, Senator Dole overreacted in his meeting with Katie Couric on the air, which he stood up and lashed out. And there's a, several articles today talking about the old Bob Dole, the hatchet man again. He's got to stay up. He's got to stay positive in these areas. And, and uh, so I think this is uh, f this is fraught with some landmines for Senator Dole. 
Here's Howard Kurtz and David Broder in Tobacco Flare-Up, Echoes of the Old Dole. Contentions encounter with TV Co. says candidates' allies uneasy. What do you make of this week's press for him? Um, I think the Corey thing's a complete distraction, and I always thought that um, for, for Dole to say something as mild to Bush as stop lying about my record, um, for that to be considered a, a terrible, fierce, dark side thing to say, always baffled me. Um, only people who have a really banal attitude to politics could say that that was really combative. Um, the issue in this um, Couric row is not whether she was mean to him or indeed he was rude to her, because we should all be grown up enough you know, to not bother with that. The issue is, does Senator Dole say things that he's paid to say by campaign donors? And the answer is yes, he does. So I think it's a very bad day for him. He, I mean, he also says things that he knows not to be true, that, that are self-evidently untrue. And I speak as a confirmed smoker and smoker's rights person. I consider myself also to be, to that extent, addicted to nicotine. Um, it, it's idle and childish to maintain otherwise. Um, the other way it's a bad day for Dill is this incredibly ill-advised photograph he's had taken of himself. It, it appears in different versions uh, with Ronald Reagan, um, who, though I personally don't think he was mentally or physically competent to be president at the time, certainly is no longer mentally or physically competent. And it, it shows. And it just reminds people that Dole is older now than Reagan was when he first ran. And I think that, um, well, it's something he might not have wanted to uh, play up so much. The campaign is calling this a, a, a red letter day, a banner day to be able to visit with yeah. President Reagan. I, I think uh, well, that's President, Ray that story, President right? Reagan is still very well remembered. It was a time in Washington where you had no hint of corruption, uh, basically, around the, the president, around the president oh, personally. Yeah. I just no, thought that's really not the, at all the, the economy. Way. The economy was uh, moving very well in those days. There was a, a values. Uh, President uh, Reagan left with some some very very good numbers. California is a critical state uh, in this election where the Republicans have been cantered out, and I think for that reason it's a good it's a good day. Under President Reagan, illegal money was raised from drugs and from the sale of uh, illegal weapons and the trading in human lives to conduct an illegal, unconstitutional foreign well, policy for a start. And Reagan was president of that secret government as well as of the legal well, we've government. Had this, we've had he was, much a, he was a, a regular habitual liar. And as for the economy, we're still living with his, with his deficit. Well, it was or, actually, or a, part actually of it's, a, it's a congressional there. deficit by and large. Here's another photograph from that visit, and we'll look at it as we go to your calls. First is from College Park, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thank you, C-SPAN. And I do appreciate you, and I do watch you an awful lot to get an alternative uh, voice on the news. Um, the other thing is that uh, I happen to be, which I wasn't going to say anything, I happen to be a Reagan Democrat. Um, so I do think that President Reagan was a very valuable person and a very great president. Who will you be supporting this year? Uh, well, a, a Dole, of course. Um, the thing is that really bothers me, though, with our president that we have at the present time is how can we trust our um, peace treaties, some of these other things, if we can't trust a person in their private life, which we don't have to see, but which we happen to have seen, how can we trust him on major things when, um, you know, I don't understand how we say, oh, it doesn't matter. It does matter. If I do something in my private life that is not right, I don't feel I can go out and represent myself as somebody else uh, around the corner. Okay, let me ask you, you said um, obviously as a Reagan Democrat you're going to be supporting Dole. Uh, explain that. Uh, because I did change parties uh, after this last election um, because I just didn't feel that I was any longer wanted in the uh, Democratic Party. So you're a Reagan Republican in fact? Yes, now. Well, okay. It's just not the way you started. It's a dull Republican now. But <laughs> yeah, in fact, a dull Republican. Well, you just began by saying you were a Reagan Democrat. Well, I, I think... Or are. Yeah. Well, I... Anyway, you... I there's another thing you seem to... There's another thing you seem to assume that we'll understand from what you say, but you haven't made it very clear. What, what leader, what private life? Talk about the president we have at the present time. Right. If we, if we can't trust a person to be faithful and true to to his wife, his, his own morals, if he has any, or whatever, how can we trust him to be true to us as an American people um, when he's doing other things? Well, I think the public has always had a differentiation between somebody's private life 
and how they act in public. And it's a, you know, in both for representatives in Congress, we've had members who have been reprimanded on the floor for bad personal behavior who've gone on and given high marks by their constituencies. And a number of presidents have shown, shown infidelity uh, in the past. Many of them have learned about after uh, their time in office, but it hasn't seemed to affect uh, their public posture. Since we're speaking on the 4th of July, um, uh, one might mention, I mean, for example, uh, and since you're from Virginia, Congressman, so take, take an example at random. Thomas Jefferson um, appears to have had a very spotty private life, um, to have owned slaves, even though he was opposed in principle to slavery. Uh, uh, so for the, I mean, uh, the question is, does his ownership of slaves discredit his opposition to slavery? The answer is no, it doesn't discredit his opposition to it. It just shows that, these, that the relationship between the private and public life is rather complicated. It is complicated. And voters are pretty good at sorting those out. The difficulty becomes when that private life starts affecting the public decisions. Yeah. And then it becomes overlapping and can, can in fact, become uh, fatal. Uh, and I mean, what, yes. they have a saying in boxing, you know, you, you beat the, the body and the head will go. That's what we may be seeing in, in the Whitewater episode with the uh, coupled with Filegate and all of these other items. It hasn't accumulated to a critical mass yet where it has affected the relative standing. It's oh. just been on the margins, but the potential, I think, is still there. I've never heard that expression before. It's a disgusting expression, isn't it? It's a boxing it's, expression. It's a guy thing. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm sure that, um, that um, if it was President Clinton who was on his second marriage and Senator Dole who was on his first, that wouldn't make any difference to you at all, would it, ma'am? Family it's values as you are. Oh, well, to all the other family values types out there, a point to ponder on this your Independence Day. Little Rock, California. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Hitchens. It's not very often I agree with you, but I'm Yeltsin, I do. Okay. However, I have several things I'd like to say. So, Susan, please give me a chance. Well, you know, the only thing is make it brief because everybody wants to get through. Did you say Little Rock, California? Yeah. I didn't know there was a Little Rock. You know, Rock, I want to say this. As the, the United States court system acted in the manner of which the Senate acted, <clears throat> that it took them four long years to investigate Watergate, and all they could come up with was a bunch of innuendos. Now, if it took a court four years to solve a case, I don't know where we'd all be. They have put him on a cross and crucified him. You know, this president, when we have a national disaster, he's right on it. California, the earthquake, the freeways are up and running in six months. The man did everything he could. His, his, that whitewater thing happened years ago. They said they'd crucify him, and they did. Who's they? Senator Dole and all the rest of the Republicans said they weren't going to make his presidency easy. And they haven't made it easy. Well, let me tell you something. They dropped the water gate, or the, wa the white water, and it's not on going on notice to the American public that they dropped it one day because the next day they had file gate. That's the only reason they dropped water, that white water. Okay, last comment for me, please. Last comment, as I think, leave him alone. He hasn't done anything so terrible. I've heard him called maniacal liar and everything else. And yet, what has he done in his presidency that would warrant us all calling him such bad names? How can he wake up every morning and do the job he's doing when he's got so many enemies out there? Okay, thank you for your call from Little Rock, California. Mr. Davis? Well, he certainly has a friend in Little Rock, California. The Whitewater uh, probe in the Senate ended because it had a time period put on by the Senate. It was limited by the Democrats who would only agree to extend the probe to a certain time. I'm sure that if uh, Senator D'Amato and the Republicans had had their say, this would still be going on, and they wouldn't have made their report at the time uh, they did. But once again, the caller makes a differentiation between public policy issues and the others, and there's always a, a, a rally around the uh, president among supporters at a time like this when there's a piling on. I would just add, with the whole Filegate episode, White House clearly made some mistakes. They're not even, even sure of the depth of those mistakes, and they've been a little bit too quick on the trigger in terms of covering this up with their rapid response. And a number of the rapid responses they have made to this have not uh, borne out, uh, been borne out by the facts. They've had to revise their story. Media then smells something, and I think that is why you're seeing piling on. In this case, it's been mistakes uh, from the White House. Whether this ends up dying a slow death or it goes away quickly, I think, is going to depend on how they handle it from here and how the probe goes. But this is, they've created their own uh, mess in this particular case. Anything on this? Only, only one comment, which is it, it does annoy me when people say that it's somehow the fault of the investigators that the thing has 
been dragged out. I mean, it's, it isn't because of the curiosity of journalists or congressmen that there have been tremendous outbreaks of amnesia in and around the White House and its defenders, that documents that couldn't be found suddenly turn up at the last available minute and so forth. That's what leads to delay. And for those who think that there's nothing in that, to blame the delay on the investigation just seems to me to be a double dose of hypocrisy. Chris, let me, can I just add one thing, Chris? You, you were here on this show, Chris, when, I, when Jack Quinn called in and the, they exerted executive privilege over a number of documents that delayed us getting these documents by a month. The White House has stonewalled these investigations every chance that they have had, and it's pulling teeth getting them out. And it was only when the contempt citation was voted out of the committee and was going to be voted out of the House floor that documents were, uh, at that point, released and they have led to more and more inquiry. And they're going to be more. I think if we, they could have been forthcoming all at one time, this could have been over a long time ago. Yeah. Albuquerque is next. You're on the air. Good morning. Yeah, uh, Susan. Yes, sir. C-SPAN junkie have been since I retired five well, welcome. years ago. And uh, I would like to comment on what isn't in our local paper, the Albuquerque Journal. I'll find this in uh, a Republican publication, Rising Tide. And it says that uh, this is Haley Barber. Clinton vetoed the platform he ran on in uh, 92, 91 rather, and uh, is running on it again. Now that's chutzpah. Like your comment, please. Well, does it give a couple specifics of what he vetoed that, that from the platform? Well, he vetoed on uh, he vetoed welfare reform, which is uh, one of the things he ran on, uh, Medicare reform. He ran on that. Okay. Thanks very much. Christopher Hitchens, I'll start with you. It's interesting. I didn't know Haley Barber had said that, but I know that um, a lot of Dole's advisors go into orbit when he says, as he did recently in Delaware and has said on other occasions too, that if you vote for Dole, you'll get the program that Clinton promised you last time. Uh, the, the reason his staff don't like him saying that is he more or less gives the game away, that there's that um, if Clinton was a Reagan Democrat or a, or a Fulwell Democrat or a, excuse me, a Fulwell Republican or a Reagan Republican, um, there would be something for Dole to run on. But to have two moderate Republicans running makes it boring for us and exasperating, I think, for Dole. Two moderate Republicans. That's essentially where Republicans you see them the both, race, yes. both falling on the yeah, political I mean, scale. Yeah, Clinton's original politics, there's a lot of argument about this. I'll, I'll tell you where I come out on it, though you haven't yet asked me. Um, a lot of people say, well, Clinton's a secret liberal. If he, if he got a second term, he would, or his old leftism would show and so forth. The alternative to that is to argue, which is what I would argue, that he was always trying to move the Democratic Party to the right uh, ever since he began his political career, that he ran from the right. In many cases, he ran against Bush from the right. Um, and that there is no secret or hidden liberalism or leftism in his agenda. Um, and that's really why the GOP is punching air in this campaign and can't land a, can't land a glove on him. Well, so let me just say that I, I think that having a Democratic Congress certainly pulled him to the left. And instead of the middle class tax cut that he promised, they ended up with tax increases and going after deficit reduction in a way that maybe the president wouldn't have wanted to if he had a different Congress to deal with. Now that there's a Republican Congress, the president has moved toward the middle and Congress has frankly given him some room to do that. Uh, but in terms of his actual actions, whether it's welfare reform, balanced budget, or whatever, the rhetoric still uh, far outstrips his actions. And I think that's going to be a huge campaign issue as we move forward, that the president can talk one way, is rhetorically uh, 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 very effusive and very good uh, in talking the moderate line. But when it comes down to actual issues, what has he uh, produced? That's what campaigns are all about. And I think Haley Barber is sounding one of the themes we'll be hearing in the fall, that he talks one way and governs the other. And the voters uh, so far uh, are not convinced that's the case. Monday through Friday on this program, we talk to a young person who will be voting for the first time in the 1996 election. Many of them have been participants and winners in C-SPAN's first vote college scholarship program. This is an entry from Peter Garcia of Miami, Florida. He wrote a poem and did a sketch and if you'll indulge me for a minute, I'll show you on the screen, I'll read you just a little bit of his poem. It went so fast, tender young years, now the law calls me mister, a child, a man who must now perform his duty, another choice. Just one more ordinary decision. Yet is it so, so very simple? Do I now carry fate upon my shoulders? Do I choose Democrat, Republican? There is always independent, just one more simple choice. Goes on to suggest that it's not so simple after all. And Peter Garcia is on the line with us right now. Good morning, Mr. Garcia. Good morning. 
I'm wondering uh, how you feel your choice is evolving as, uh, since you wrote this, which was much earlier in the year. Well, when I first wrote it, it was really, uh, I was not as really politically aware as I say myself now. And even now, I still have a long way to go as a, uh, Ameri as a future American voter. Um, and I've been reading things up, and I've looked up um, different positions. Some things uh, disturb me about uh, about Dole running for president. Uh, some of the things he said, and what I saw this morning in the M Miami Herald, he said that he could be another Reagan. And he went on to cite some of the things such as the uh, tax cuts, strong defense, and other things. One of the things that strikes me, you know, just recently graduating from high school, taking a, uh, an American government class, our Constitution is a highly evolving document, and yet here he is citing someone from the Cold War. I'm not trying. Now, please don't please don't think I'm trying to completely discredit uh, P President Reagan. What I'm just well, trying to say you, is that I wouldn't mind if you were. <laughs> I think if it hadn't been for for President Reagan, we may still be in the Cold War. Had you thought had you thought that you were going to support Senator Dole? Um, actually, no. Actually, no. Um, and part of the reason, I guess, maybe you could say it's a bit selfish. Uh, something else that I have uh, seen was that um, m uh, Mr. Clinton, and President Clinton, is proposing tax credits to help pay, uh, help pay for college. Whereas in many cases, I've heard uh, not only from my own state government, but also from Republicans, that they want to make it more expensive for students to get an education. Well, do I, hold on that, just a second. Just, that is just absolute bunk and rhetoric in terms of making it more expensive. We've expended Pell Grants, and there are more student loans available today than ever before. The issue has been whether it is a direct loan program the government directly does or whether it's going to be third party, which is the way most of us took our college loans and is, I think, proved uh, probably more efficient and has put more capital in, in the marketplace. Let me also add that the president's uh, uh, tax credit for students is something Republicans don't oppose. And it was only after the Republican Congress came up with its own set of tax cuts that the president embraced this. He had two years as president with his own Congress in there, and this was never even proposed at that time. So there's a lot of rhetoric going on in, in these areas. I would think as a young person that I would be concerned about that deficit and what opportunities that's going to offer me in the future because with, the, with almost 20 cents of every tax dollar now going for interest on the national debt, and that's slated to rise, it makes it much more difficult for our, our younger generation coming up. And to me, that would be the overriding issue. What's going to be left for you uh, the way we continue uh, the, the deficit in federal spending at this point? Peter Garcia, what do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Well, if it does, granted, if it does continue the way it's going and it does increase, you're right, <laughs> there won't be much left at all. Mr. Garcia, by the way, you're young yet, but you'll, you'll, you'll soon get the knack of it. You have to watch um, when congressmen like Mr. Davis say, um, what a great man Ronald Reagan was and how sweet his memory is and how fragrant in our nostrils is the recollection of him. And then to tell you that we're still paying 20 cents on the dollar in national debt as if the two things were completely unconnected. Keep, keep an eye on things like that, you'll learn a lot. Oh, yes, like I said, I wasn't, you know, I'm not trying to destroy the memory of President Reagan. Well, I wish, I wish you were. I, I certainly am. Yeah. But um, what, what, by the way, the quote you have from Senator Dole on this is uh, nearly right, but not quite. What Senator Dole actually said was, I'll be Ronald Reagan if that's what you want. That's what he said to yeah. his uh, listeners. In other words, you know, tell me what you wish I'd say and I'll say it. Um, another, another great feature of, of modern campaigning. Peter Garcia, lots of people your age don't pay attention. Uh, what has gotten you interested? Why are you following this more closely all the time? Well, um, and, you know, everybody has their own dreams. Uh, me, personally, just from some of my own experience uh, at one time and possibly still now, I've always thought about maybe even one day running for president. Great. <laughs> well, I hope you keep your dreams. It's, it's possible. I, uh, the, the great thing about this country is that anybody can grow up and be president with a little luck and a lot of hard work, and I hope you pursue your dreams. At a minimum, maybe you'll be uh, uh, led into, into some kind of government service. I don't think there's a higher calling. How will you uh, start to pursue this? What's next for you? Well, um, after my first semester in, uh, over at Florida State University, I'm looking at a possible internship uh, with a lobbyist group in Tallahassee. And then hopefully from there, just, um, you know, maybe possibly build contacts, just get a feel and understand an even better understanding of government. Because really, the only way you ever really understand something is by being a part of it.
That's how I feel. Okay. Thanks very much. Good Congratulations luck. on good your uh, award with us, and good luck in your college career. Thank you very much. Happy Fourth of July. Thank you, sir. Peter Garcia of Miami joining us this morning from nearby in Hialeah, Florida. Go back to telephone calls. Next is Reston, Virginia. Good morning. Good morning, and a happy Independence Day to everyone there. Good morning. A um, couple of things. First off, I, uh, I'm solidly in the president's corner. I, I get so tired of hearing all the venom spewed from the right, and I guess we get out called on C-SPAN about 5 to 1, I think I heard Brian say one day, so I'm glad you have the two lines set up so we can get some equal representation here. Uh, a number of things. The press and the Republicans were all set to uh, crucify the president once again if we lost uh, Russia to the communists. Well, now that uh, the communists have been defeated, I'm wondering if the press is going to uh, praise the administration for doing a lot to uh, further the reforms, albeit uh, tentative reforms going on in that country. I can hardly wait to see the headlines uh, tomorrow to see how well the administration did in promoting that. Uh, but the story I'm interested in now is a, a letter that's in the current issue of Mother Jones magazine, and it says, Dole's real war record. And uh, if you give me a second, I'll read it to you. It says, the press has missed the story of how Bob Dole deliberately avoided combat service in World War II until weeks before the end of the war. The Dole homepage on the World Wide Web says, quote, in 1942, at the age of 19, Bob Dole answered the call to serve his country by joining the Army to fight World War II. He became a second lieutenant in the Army's 10th Mountain Division and in the spring of 1943 found himself in the hills of Italy fighting the Nazi Germans, end quote. In December of 1942, Bob Dole signed up for the Army Reserve, a maneuver that allowed him to complete his sophomore year at the University of Kansas. That, that, that is exactly from his homepage, a maneuver that allowed him? Or is that from uh, the article? I'm, that was the end quote at the end of oh, the okay. Germans. Then right. the writer goes on. All right. It says, in December of 1942, Bob Dole signed up for the Army Reserve, a maneuver that allowed him to complete his sophomore year at the University of Kansas. Okay. Now, uh, we we're running out of time. So w what's the end point of all this? Well, the, the wind-up is that he didn't get into the war by uh, until the end, about 16 days before Hitler and Eva Braun killed themselves. And it's a shame he got wounded. But he's pitching himself as he started out at 18. And this story is written by Peter G. Weinberg of this letter, Formal Corporal, 503rd Parachute Combat Team, Stanford, Connecticut. So if you want to talk about character and honor, uh, I think the Marlboro man himself, Mr. Dole, has a lot to account for. And I just get tired of the president being constantly hammered by the uh, right wing. I think he's got more character in his baby finger than Mr. Dole has. All right, sir. Thanks. Rest in Virginia. For, first of all, let me say on, on the Russian situation, I supported the president on that. I think he was right. I think he, uh, he, can, he can bask in the glow of a uh, Yeltsin uh, win. John Kennedy was asked uh, why, how he became a war hero with PT-109. He said it was easy. He said, uh, uh, the enemy sank my boat. I think in this particular case, uh, you're not going to be able to take away from Senator Dole the fact that he had those injuries. He did serve in that, and I, I don't see that as a very good avenue for exploration. Maybe somebody in the media will try to do that, but I think that's probably unassailable. Um, <clears throat> I don't consider myself a great friend of the right wing either, I'm bound to say, um, but it isn't me, but President Clinton, who's hired uh, Dick Morris, who used to advise Senator Helms, to be his campaign director. So if you don't like the right, there are, you, there's lots of room for you to um, express your doubts and misgivings. Um, it seems to be one of those calls that makes you realize how partisanship and bipartisanship in combination sort of rot the brain. Obviously, the Clinton policy on Russia is the Bush-Baker policy and the Dole policy and the, the policy of the American establishment. That was, there was no, there wasn't a, a, an inch of difference between any party leader on it and, and nothing, there would have been no recrimination of that sort if Mr. Yeltsin hadn't Pulled it off, so I don't accept the grammar of the question. Um, I'm prepared to believe that um, Senator Dole may have um, claimed to have been more enthusiastic about the Second World War than he really was, but I don't think you can possibly take away from him the fact that he very nearly lost his arm and his life and very nearly bled to death. I've been to the village in the Apennines where he, where he got hit and looked around the terrible terrain to be fighting in. You can't take that away from him. On the other hand, he did say, and as far as I know, it's never attracted saying, in a very considered statement made in reply to Vice President Mondale in a, in a high-level debate, that he regards the Second World War as a Democrat war. And he made uh, no secret of the fact that that, in his mind, was a pejorative. In other words, that it wasn't worth fighting and that it was a, that it was a partisan war. Now, that, seems to me to, that does seem to me to take away from the credit he otherwise claims for having fought bravely against fascism.
Chris, the quote was actually Democratic Wars. It included Democrat, World War One. Democrat Wars. Oh, yeah, de but it included World War I uh, and uh, World well, he, War II. Well, and for one thing, he blamed all the wars fought in this century by the United States on the Democratic the Party, Vietnam. which he calls the Democrat Party. Um, a Vietnam, I'd give him on that. But the Second World War, well, he's still stuck with saying it's a Democrat war, and in that, to that extent, something not worth fighting in. Now, that he has to live with that. And that's why we have to live with him there for it. Just uh, a lighter side for a moment. You've been very careful several times this morning to wish us a happy Independence Day. Uh, I might explain to our audience <laughs> that you are uh, were born in the UK. And, and therefore can't run for president. I was just thinking about it when Mr. Garcia was talking. <laughs> Neither can Henry Kissinger. I mean, no one who wasn't born here can run. But uh, it makes me sad. You've been somewhere. here 15 years now? 14 years next week. Any sense that there might be some creeping Americanism? At oh, yes, point? yeah. I've, well, since I first came on C-SPAN, I've become the father of three Americans, for one thing. They can become How president. How about that? They can all become president. Just a small item in the, in the post this morning from your homeland. This uh, on the Names and Faces column. Royalty is only an admission fee away. Buckingham Palace, Queen Elizabeth's residence in London will stay open every summer for paying visitors from this point on. Last year, more than 400,000 people trooped through the palace, generating more than $4.6 million. What does the Queen want with all this money? Oh, these Hanoverians just don't know when to quit. But if that wasn't so, we wouldn't all be here celebrating the 4th of July. Next is New Orleans. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, I'm very nervous. This is the first time I've ever been able to get in. And um, I wanted to speak with Congressman Davis about Senator Dole with Katie Couric. I watched that. Senator Dole said the right thing. I don't know why you saying uh, something completely different about him. He said that he didn't want the FDA to, um, to take over the tobacco to, to treat it as a drug. I'm, excuse me. Well, I'm not, quarreling. I'm not quarreling with that. Actually, I was looking at the news interpretations where he, he, uh, where he said something to her about the liberals in the media and tried to turn it as an attack by, by the media on there. Captain, she was getting very rude. And Mr. Hitchens, you can't say anything about President Reagan. The Congress holds the purses. And uh, it was the Democratic Congress that gave the money for all that. And they wanted to, dis um, to make him look bad, too. So you can't say anything bad about President Reagan. He was one of the best presidents we've ever had. And I'm sorry you weren't here when he was... He was president. I think it's time for you to, I was here for all of that, I think it's time for you to reread uh, David Stockman's um, account of the matter, his budget director, the deliberate creation of deficits. Well, you both talked about the deficit, and uh, one thing that happened this week was a decision about a uh, challenge to the line item veto legislation. Right. Uh, how significant do you think this line item veto power, as it has been crafted by the Congress, will be? I'll just tell you, I, I think the one thing it'll do, it'll prevent any kind of government shutdowns in the future because it shifts the responsibility in the end to the president. He can line out objectionable parts of that. Now, he can't add money, and that's good. He can't add money to the appropriations, but uh, uh, riders that may uh, be uh, veto bait for him, he can X out and veto those riders, and he can veto certain parts of the spending that may not comport Does with his beliefs. Does it work that simply, that a president can simply cross it off well, he, and the decision is he, done? He, he can, uh, it can be, uh, it once again, can go back to Congress, and Congress will have an opportunity to override that. Uh, but in the end, at the end of the day, you need a tiebreaker. We didn't have that this time. The President and the Congress couldn't agree, even on the language for a continuing resolution. As a result of that, the government was shut down. Now this really shifts, in, and this is a major shift in transfer of power uh, from the uh, Congress to the President. But as a member of the Congress, are you concerned about that shift of power? No, I supported it. I think you have to have a tiebreaker. The American people see the Commander-in-Chief basically as, as the person in charge. We still have a very important role, and the President can't do anything without Congress agreeing to it. Uh, but when we are overzealous or where the President feels that, he, he will have the right now to veto that, and it's going to take two-thirds to overturn that. Do you think it will have a specific effect on deficit spending? It should have a positive effect on deficit spending because the President can now zero out parts of spending bills that he, does not, he or she does not uh, agree with, and that will re help reduce the deficit. It's on the margins, but I think it's a it's What a do you then say to the about. lady who just called... Um, pulling out correctly that Congress should, if it doesn't, have the power of the purse. Well, Congress still has the power of the purse. The President can't spend money that Congress doesn't give them. Uh, let me just add, uh, two years under President Reagan, the Congress ran on continuing resolutions because the President Reagan vetoed uh, budgets he thought they were too high. 
uh, and Cong uh, Congress wanted to give more money than the President wanted to give under a line item veto, that would have reduced the deficit. But we missed the point when we talk about the 13 appropriation bills, because that's only a third of all federal spending. The other two-thirds are in entitlements, which are going up on autopilot every year without Congress or the President touching them and interest on the national debt. And until you tackle those in a meaningful way, you're really not going to get to the deficit problem. Next call is from Howell Township, New Jersey. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Happy uh, Fourth of July. Thank you. The reason I'm calling this morning is I've always voted since I was uh, 20 years old as a Republican. I served in Vietnam. I'm a disabled combat wounded veteran from Vietnam. But I am now in, the, in a phase in my life where my children are go getting ready to go to college. My mom, who is widowed, is on the Medicare. She's a widow of a civil service uh, retired employee. And I seen a article that was covered by C-SPAN where they had a um, voters representation group that was totally non-Republican or Democratic. And they showed what the proposed budgets and the tax cuts were going to be. And they also showed, it was in the evening, the disproportionate benefits that were going to the more wealthy on the Republican programs versus the benefits that were not going to be given to the lower income folks on the Democratic side of the program. So what's this all mean to you? means to me, as a person who is supporting a household with two children in college on $53,000 a year with a mortgage and living in New Jersey with a high tax rate, that the Republican Party has lost faith in, in, in us, the mid-American, the worker. Uh, they've lost uh, faith in, in, in the elderly, in, in their promises to take care of them. And they, and they come back with their figures and their rhetoric but what I've been seeing is when you actually put the facts and figures on the line, the money of each program, the Democratic and the Republican, in their taxes is very similar, except it is disproportionately going to the wealthy on the Republican side, and on the Democratic side, it's going to the people that really need it. All right, thanks for your call. Well, first of all, under the Republican plan, your taxes would have been reduced $1,000 if you've got two kids living at home. $500 uh, per child exemption would have put that back in your pocket uh, uh, immediately. There are some other cuts in that program as well, but that would have been immediate. And I don't think you're wealthy, $53,000 a year with, uh, with a couple of, of kids at home. On the loans and the Medicare, the benefits would not have been cut. They would have been increased, but by allowing choice and the market uh, forces uh, to work on that, we felt we could have held down the increase in those costs. And besides, Medicare Part A is going bankrupt anyway. The trustees just came back and showed that we're losing $25 million a day that we're paying out of Medicare, not taking in. And, and that, that's got to be fixed. And if nothing else, give the party courage for trying to tackle that issue and bring that to the forefront. We haven't brought that to, to a closure yet. But if you're a working American, it seems to me, that Republican proposal will give you some of the tax relief uh, uh, you want, and your benefits aren't to cut. Your student loans are still available to your kids, the educational opportunities and the like. So I would take issue. I didn't see that particular panel. Uh, but you are the, the uh, typical American. I think this program was made to benefit. Now, if you're sitting on welfare and not working with two or three kids, maybe you don't come out as well under the Republican plan, and I would be the first to concede that. Uh, with respect, Congressman, I think that tap dances slightly, if not past the, um, the letter, certainly past the spirit of the caller's question. What you could hear in his voice was the feeling that the country is becoming more unequal and unfair. And in fact, if you look at the, the, the reports from the Bureau of Statistics, the GAO, the Census Department, come out recently, it shows that the distribution of income and wealth in this country has become very, very, very sharply more unequal in the last 10 years. Now, as someone who has no partisan interests and who right. hasn't failed to notice that Congress was democratic for a lot of that time and... Uh, we don't argue, so we don't disagree kind of with those facts. I think, uh, I, I think it's a bipartisan responsibility, so to say, but it's, it remains a fact that the, the distribution of, of wealth and income in, in the United States is becoming much more like classical, class-divided hierarchical societies like the one I originate from um, than it has ever been before. And that you, no, no, no number of... Um, uh, figures or promises on the, 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 the juggling of uh, different pieces of legislation is going to unconvince people that that's happening to but, them. But let me make two points. In the Republican plan, first of all, on the tax cuts, the $500 per income child credit, the, the income uh, was, ta I mean, you're over 110000 a year. You don't get the tax credit. 
period. On Medicare Part B, we means test. If you're making uh, uh, over $120,000 a year, $125,000 a year, you have to pay the full boat on Medicare. There is a means test on Part B. Part A, which is the part that's paid out of the trust fund, everybody would, would get. So that is hardly uh, you know, helping the wealthy. That is trying to bring it back more toward the middle income Americans where these tar it's targeted at. But we've lost the rhetorical war, I think, uh, with, with the Democrats at this point. And I think this caller illustrates the fact that y y you talk enough about the rich versus poor and the haves and the have-nots, you can be convincing. But, but I really believe that the facts are otherwise. But how's he supposed to feel when, when he's sitting here, there, uh, disabled from having served his country? Reading about um, corporate top-level remuneration, you can open any government paper, any doesn't paper set that. any day. Government doesn't set No, we're, no we're, we're, we're talking about the society, not yeah. the government, about what, what is happening in the United States. Yeah, we've done more to cut corporate welfare over the last two but years the, in the Republican Congress than has been done in, 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 in two decades. But the, well, they, the, the, remun the top-level remuneration seems but to be going up well, very much. Same for baseball up, players in other, words, in, in, other words, the, in other words, the upward redistribution of income, the redistribution of income towards the rich seems right. to have gone on in spite of this. And then you look at the front page of the Washington Post last Sunday, Dan Morgan had an amazing story. Ten billion more dollars have been given to the military industrial complex by Congress than even Clinton asked for, and he asked for a lot, to the point where all across the South, they managed to create special new boondoggle projects just, just to make sure the money gets spent. They literally have been given more than they know what to do with. No, I, the worst, the world uh, there are scandals of this kind in every paper every day, and it's, it's staring everybody in the face. The country is, is Spending more money on military is not a scam. Military spending has dropped each of the last 10 years in this country. Defense spending has dropped, where next year we'll be spending more money on interest on the national debt than we will for all of national defense together. Uh, I think uh, many of us, including some of the uh, military leaders that have served under this president, are very, very uh, cautious and think maybe defense spending is something we've cut a little bit too much. We've made this, this mistake after the Revolutionary War, and we ended up fighting the War of 1812. After World War I, we disarmed, and we had to rearm for World War II. We need to downsize military, but we've done that in a significant way. 55% of the federal, uh, in 1955, 62% of the federal budget was defense. Today it's 17%. I didn't, actually, I didn't say this, this money was actually being spent on the defense of the country. It's, to the contrary, it's being spent on what I've heard called unsmilingly the contractor community. Let me get a call. Which is also the donor community. But that's research and development, much of oh, yes. Yeah. Fremont, Ohio, good morning. Uh, hello. First, I want to say I was raised as a Democrat. And my first vote was for John Kennedy. And then I voted independent for a few years. Now I'm a Republican because the Democratic Party now is definitely not the party of my father. Uh, he's the one that told me to always vote straight Democrat, which through the years I've seen the things that they do and my morals just won't let me vote for him anymore. So this will be your first vote for a Republican? Oh, no. I've voted for Republicans ever since Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. The only Democrat I ever voted for was John Kennedy. I went independent for a while. Was it your morals that um, guided you on that occasion, ma'am? Uh, well... I feel I have to ask. I see the lying. I've watched the entire thing of the water, uh, the Whitewater hearings. Uh, even to staying up till five in the morning sometimes to watch them. And you can see that these people that came up here from Arkansas are doing a big cover up. Color, thank you. Th thanks. If uh, I were partners with someone that was getting all that money, I'd be mad as hell if I didn't get any of it. All right. Thank you very much for calling in from Fremont, Ohio. Uh, we uh, have about seven minutes left in our program. However, Congressman Davis has to leave the table because it is the 4th of July, one of right. the busiest days for politicians. It, it is on. the busiest day of the year. We have ahead of you. I've got a parade in Fairfax City. I've got a parade in Dale City. I'm going to be out in Vienna, uh, Herndon. We've got fireworks uh, tonight out there. So. It's, it's a long day. It's the longest day of the year if you're in elective office, but it's a great day. We look forward to this awesome. every year. Hot dogs and hamburgers. Let me just thank, thank all, uh, the calls. I think they've been very good from both sides. This is still a country with a lot of ticket splitters, and as you can tell, uh, well, we've had some partisans call in today. 
Uh, still a lot of issues up in the air. This could be an interesting campaign year, and I appreciate all the attention that your listeners and, and, and watchers give every day. Thanks, C-SPAN, for what they're doing. Thanks for coming in on the holiday. Okay, thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Hitchens, we'll continue at the table with your comments and calls. Single-handed. Single-handedly. I think you're up to it, Christopher. Oh, um, let me just ask you a, a question. Uh, this is uh, amusing, I guess, more than a news story on the front page of the New York Times about the meaning of patriotism. Uh, and mm. Dirk Johnson has written this piece. He says, since the fall of communism, mm -hmm. the absence of a superpower enemy and the advent of an all-volunteer armed forces, Americans' feelings about their own country have little to do with battlefields and are no longer so easy to define. They've become complicated by domestic debates about issues like race, immigration, and environmentalism. You can't narrow it down to just our country anymore. It's the whole planet, said a 43-year-old waitress at a restaurant in Sycamore, Illinois. Oh, yes, I saw that. Now, didn't she go on to say that if they cut down trees in the Amazon, it affects right. everybody? That's right. That's right. Well, that was an intelligent observation, obviously, but... Uh, I, thought, I, thought the premise, I thought the premise of the piece, there are always a lot of soft pieces in the, in the press on the 4th of July. Usually sort of slightly feel-good ones. I've got one I'd like to mention, actually. Sure. But uh, the, the working assumption that patriotism would have to be defined in a martial manner is, for a start, untrue, or at least very questionable. I'm, I'm not saying this just because it is Independence Day, um, but it seems to be very obvious that the, the heart of American patriotism is, is the fact of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's what your officials take their oath to, quite correctly. That's what, is, that's what we swear to uphold and defend. That's what makes the distinctive element of the American Revolution, and that's something anyone can be proud of because it's a very well-written essay in liberty. Um, so I thought that the the article sort of zigzagged around um, and, and failed really to score any points at all. Do you think Americans, whether it, it, the premise is in the Constitution or not, as uh, when you travel, talk to, to taxi drivers and like, are questioning what it means to be American, be patriotic these days? Uh, I mean, the, the country's always being remade and it's always in transition. And uh, uh, Scott Fitzgerald used to say, um, I read as well as talk to taxi drivers and, and barmen, by the way, um, used to say there are no second acts in American lives. I, I don't know why that's so well remembered a remark of his because it seems to me the reverse is the case. I mean, the, it's been in the process of being made ever since the 4th of July 1776 and the fact that the composition of the country is changing um, through immigration and natural wastage and so on is only the latest in a huge number of remaking. I'll try to get two more calls in about the five minutes we have left at the table. Our next, fittingly, on the 4th of July is from Philadelphia. Good morning. Uh -huh. Good morning. How are you? Fine, sir. Happy Independence Day. Thank you. I would just like to say that uh, I used to be a registered Republican and um, now registered Libertarian uh, for the simple fact that uh, when you see people getting sworn in as either congressman, president, or senator, they take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And uh, my real concern was with uh, NAFTA and GATT, just to see that piece of legislation passed in the lame duck of uh, of the Congress and the Senate uh, really, uh, you know, really upsetting because of just the way uh, our tyranny and uh, it was just our jobs are just going away. Define what it means very briefly for you to be a libertarian. Well, you, uh, you believe in the constitutional values, uh, what this country was founded on, and uh, that's government in your lives. Okay. Uh, Thanks for your call from Philadelphia. Libertarian Convention is actually meeting here in Washington today and tomorrow to nominate their candidate for president. We're going to be covering it these both days. Uh, what do you think of the libertarian movement? Well, I have some sympathy with the libertarian worldview, um, th with the permanent distrust of the state, for example, and um, also with the concept of victimless crime, that you know there are certain things that the government just cannot be expected to take care of for you. Um, including what you decide to put in, in your mouth or uh, in your system, um, or with whom you're going to have sexual congress, or, and, or even how. Um, but they, in that sense, say, hands off, and I'm all for them. Doing Can I bring that. you back then to your cigarette comment on that? Oh, sure. Uh, because you, you suggested you were critical of Senator Dolfer's comments about it, but you do have sympathy for uh, the, the view that government shouldn't be involved in. Uh, re regulating or commenting about nicotine addiction. Well, that's right, but, but what Senator Dole was saying was as far as he knew the, the habit wasn't addictive, which seems to me a ridiculous proposition. Um, probably couldn't be said by anyone who, I mean, like 
so if a girl isn't a smoker, uh, or slave to it like I am. But, and also, obviously, has too close a relationship to the huge donation it's had from the tobacco industry. That seemed to me to be the salient point there. Right. But, I mean, I've noticed that, yes, there was a tendency in the, uh, in the health-minded uh, authoritarian campaign against tobacco for it to be a movement that actually targets not the producers but the consumers. And yes, that there, is a, there is a nanny state element to it that I resent. And so I like, I like the libertarian tone of voice, and I'm glad that they're there. The problem is that what they tend to say is that also the government has no business regulating child labor either and things like that. So there we part company. Santa Barbara, California, last call for this segment. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I was curious that um, with the terrorism bill, there was a rider attached on there where habeas corpus was lost or written away. And it seemed to me that the press has pretty much avoided this. There hasn't been a lot written about it or talked about, and I find that really dangerous because that um, seems to be an important part of, you know, uh, American uh, recourse for Americans, and, it, and it's now gone. And um, I don't think a lot of people truly understand the meaning of what it was and what we've lost. I'm Thanks very much. Would very, you explain? Yeah, I'm please? extremely glad someone brought that up, and I'm ashamed it wasn't me, in fact. I mean, the, people should read what it says in this bill. Um, the best uh, short article by it was, um, about it, excuse me, was by Nat Hentoff in his column, Sweet Land of Liberty, in the Washington Post about three Saturdays ago, if you want to pull it off um, or download it from anywhere. Um, and one of the points he made was, where is the protest about this? I think Senator Moynihan said something. I think there were a couple of other squeaks raised, but it was a decision of immense moment, and it, in, in effect it does make habeas corpus void if, if the word terrorism can be attached to any, any aspect of the crime that's alleged against somebody. I thought it was a scandalous piece of legislation, and, wouldn't, and it's one of the reasons why I so much distrust uh, partisanship by partisanship stuff, because if the Republicans had proposed it, it would have been very much more opposed. It's one of those things that only the Democrats can get away with doing. That's how sordid it is. Our time is just about up, but you had one story that you said you wanted to mention that was sort of a lighter Oh, piece. the heartwarming Fourth of July type story. Uh, one of the ones today is, it's on, I made a note of what page it's on, A16 of the New York Times, it says that intermarriage, which is the most authentic form of integration after all, the most unarguable form, uh, between black and white Americans is going up um, steadily, upward increasing curve, and there are lots of... <coughs> um, <coughs> Excuse me, you see what I mean about the smoking factor? There are lots of very nice sort of feel-good bits at the opening of the story. And then, just towards the end, you get let down with a bump because it says a large number of black young women feel they have no choice but to um, marry, as the article says, outside their race because of the enormous numbers of young black eligible men who are now in jail. So the story doesn't, doesn't end as uh, heartwarmingly as it begins. Why do you think that's especially appropriate for a day like today? Well, I think it was, I think it originally ran where it did, as a sort of Fourth of July type story, and then you find as you go into it that the evidence isn't as uniformly encouraging as you might have thought. How will you be spending this holiday? Uh, working as usual. Not so going I, down to the mall or anything like that? No, I'm going to take the weekend off. I'm going to go up to, to Long Island, but um, no, it's a weekday, so it's a work day for me. In Washington, by the way, many of the people who uh, live in the area come down to spend the day here. Lots of uh, activities, all sponsored by the National Park Service, all free to people, including a fireworks display. Uh, and uh, that's it for our time. I want to thank Christopher Hitchens for being at the table, along with Congressman Davis, who just left us on this Fourth of July holiday. Come back soon. Absolutely. We'll be back in a, a few minutes. Thank you.